Today I want to talk about transformation in oncogenesis and I want to start with an experiment that illustrates what we're talking about. We start with, a, in this case, a hamster embryo, but it could be any source of mammalian cells. We mince it up, make single cells in suspension, and then we put them onto plastic dishes with culture medium on top of them. The cells typically will adhere to the plastic and will grow. And on the left, you can see a plate of cells. If you looked at them under a microscope, you could see individual cells. They would grow, and you would split them periodically once they reached confluence. But eventually, they would die because they're not immortal. However, if you took the same cells and treated them in a variety of ways, with a chemical as shown here, sometimes UV light, or a virus, you can make the cells immortal. And you will get what we call transformed cells. And they're shown here as growing very strongly. Uh, and at the bottom is a higher magnification of what these two conditions look like. So on the left would be our normal monolayer of cells derived from this embryo. They're very well behaved. They form a nice monolayer. They touch each other. They stop growing. On the right is the transformed cell. Again, it's been treated with uh, a, a variety of substances, which we'll explore a bit today. And it makes these cells immortal. This is what we mean by having transformed cells. So the idea that you could change the basic properties of cells in culture and make them transformed has been around for quite a while. And it's been known for a long time that these transformed cells have a number of different properties compared with untransformed cells. And when, uh, when scientists first discovered this, they were puzzled. They didn't really know what this meant. Today, by the end, you're going to understand what has gone on with these transformed cells. And so here are just some of the differences between normal and transformed cells. They're immortal, first of all. They grow forever. HeLa cells are a great example. These were produced from a tumor from a woman in 1951. And they have been growing ever since. And they will keep on growing. So they're immortal. They have lost anchorage dependence. Most normal cells have to attach to the plastic in order to grow. Many transformed cells don't need to do that. And they will pile up and form foci. They will grow in soft agar as well. They have a loss of contact inhibition. They pile up. So a normal monolayer, uh, you can see here on the top and at the bottom, part A, the cells grow in, in a single cell sheet. When they touch each other, they stop growing. A transformed cells will continue to grow. They'll pile up, and they're disordered. As I said, they will form colonies in semi-solid media. If you suspend these cells in agar, they will make colonies, and normal cells don't do that. And finally, they have a decreased requirement for growth factors in the medium, and this is typically provided by serum. We add serum to cell culture medium because it has all sorts of growth factors that cells need. Transformed cells need a lower percentage of this than normal cells. The other half of today's discussion is oncogenesis. So the transformation now we've defined. Oncogenesis is the development of cancer. Most cancers are solid cancers. So you have the formation of a tumor, which is a swelling caused when cells continue to, to divide without stopping. All the tissues in our body uh, have the certain morphology because they stop dividing. The cells that make them up stop dividing at a certain point. Tumor cells or oncogenic cells do not do that. They form a mass called a tumor. And that tumor can be either benign or malignant. It can re remain contained or it can spread to other tissues, i.e. be metastatic. So there's some non-solid cancers, of course, like leukemias, but they are the minority, most of them are solid tumors. So that's what oncogenesis is, the formation of a cancer. Cancer is a genetic disease. And we now know you need about a dozen mutations in different genes that encode signaling pathways that regulate cell proliferation, uh, survival, and the determination of cell fate, and finally, maintenance of genome integrity. So we have a variety of protein, uh, proteins in the cell that find errors in our DNA when they arise and correct them. They find breaks in the DNA and so forth. 
and mutation, <coughs> mutations in those are part of what drives uh, cancer to develop. These mutations, this dozen or so mutations, they can be inherited. You can inherit it from your parents. They may have had a variety of mutations each. They pass them on to you. They can be caused by DNA damage. If you're out in the sun too much, you can get skin cancers because of the, the UV light in the sun is causing mutations in your DNA. Various chemicals in the environment can cause cancer as well. And finally, today's topic, viruses can cause cancer, but they actually, they actually, as you will see, do not cause cancer. They cause cells to be transformed so that they're on their way to becoming a cancer. So here we have transformed cells on the left. We can make these in culture. They may or may not be oncogenic. These transformed cells are on the way to becoming cancer cells, but they need to accumulate more mutations in order to do that. So here on the right we have a mouse with a solid tumor, which has been made by injecting cells into the mouse. That tumor needs more mutations compared to the transformed cells. So the reason this, this has all been sorted out by studying how viruses transform cells. That's what we're going to talk about today. So viruses transform cells, and transformation, remember, makes them immortal. They keep dividing forever. And when that happens, mutations accumulate, and eventually, if you get the right 12 or so mutations, that transformed cell will become a cancer. So this is a very important distinction between transformation and a, and a cancer cell. Transformation, you have altered cell properties, but it's not necessarily going to lead to tumors unless additional changes occur. So we're going to talk about how uh, studying virus transformed cells really helped us to understand the progression to cancer. And one of the things you should remember is no virus can do it all. That means no virus on its own can cause a cancer. It needs help from the DNA of the cell. What viruses do, as you will see, it makes cells divide, and then they need to accumulate the mutations that lead to a cancer. So the virus itself, the only thing the virus is doing is making the cells divide uncontrollably. Uh, these are a list, this is a list of both RNA and DNA viruses. Uh, that are associated with cancers, not just in people, but uh, also in other animals. There are, uh, we've talked about hepatitis C virus, uh, the retroviruses, which we'll talk about today, and then the DNA viruses, adenoviruses, hepatitis B viruses, herpes viruses, papillomaviruses, polyomaviruses, and even pox viruses. Viruses are the contributing factor in about 20% of human cancers. And we know of eight different viruses that are associated with human cancer. And they're listed at the bottom here. We've talked about most of these Epstein-Barr virus, uh, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, uh, HTLV-1, hu human T-cell ly ly lymphotropic virus 1, HIV-1, human papillomavirus, and the herpes, human herpes virus 8, and Merkel cell polyomavirus. The way these viruses lead to cancer is slightly different. Today we'll talk about uh, these two human viruses and also a variety of viruses that cause cancer in animal models. And one thing, another thing you need to remember here is that vir transformation and oncogenesis isn't required for the replication of any virus. It is, I guess you could say, an accident. It's a byproduct of what the viruses need to do, as you will see. Now, I have an asterisk here because for years I've made this statement because I think it's true. And, and someone emailed me a few years ago about a virus that causes tumors of fish, where it seems that actually the tumor is important for spreading the virus. We'll talk about this in a moment. So, I think there is some evidence that perhaps for that one retrovirus of fish, it's needed for replication. But for all the others, certainly the ones we'll talk about today, making a transformed cell, making a tumor is absolutely not needed for the virus to replicate. So the story begins in 1909. Peyton Rouse, uh, a virologist working at the Rockefeller uh, Medical Institute, now Rockefeller University here in New York City, he was brought a chicken 
by a farmer, as the story goes. It's not clear if that farmer brought it from New Jersey or Long Island. Brought a chicken that had a tumor on it, and Rouse got interested in this. And he did experiments where he would remove the tumor, grind up the tumor, filter it through a 0.2 micron filter, take the filtrate, and inject that into other chickens. Now, you, of course, you recognize that he is trying to find out if a virus is involved, because it's a very small filter that would exclude bacteria. Well, he found that these cell-free filtrates, which presumably vi contain viruses, in fact cause tumors in healthy chickens. So the first evidence that cancer could be caused by a virus infection. It took 50 years for people to believe this and to accept that this virus could cause cancer. Eventually, he was given the Nobel Prize in 1966. I think this is the longest incubation period for a Nobel Prize after the initial discovery. So he discovered a virus that caused solid tumors in chickens. He called it Rouse sarcoma virus. We'll talk about this quite a bit today. Other people then picked up this virus and it led to two more Nobel Prizes. So three Nobel Prizes for this uh, cancer-causing chicken virus. Really interesting. Now there is a wonderful book that describes the history of cancer called The Emperor of All Maladies. I read this several years ago when it came out. It's by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who happens to be an oncologist at Columbia. This book won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and a, a movie was just released by PBS, by Ken Burns, which you can find online. I think it's free and you can watch it for, for a time. And it's a six hour, three part, uh, made for TV movie. This book is beautiful. It's so wonderfully written. Have, has anyone read it? Isn't it great? Yeah. Yeah, he's up at uh, Columbia. You can go walk around and see him. Anyway, I've taken some quotes from his book because he says it better than I can. By the 1950s, cancer researchers had split into three feuding camps. The virologists led by Rouse claimed that viruses cause cancer, although no such virus had been found in humans. Epidemiologists argued that chemicals cause cancer, although they couldn't tell you how. And the third camp had circumstantial evidence that genes internal to the cell might cause cancer. I'm going to tell you today how virology basically unified these three different camps. Uh, continuing with Mukherjee, in 1951, a young virologist named Howard Temin arrived at Caltech. He was going to study fruit flies. He got bored with it. He'd switched fields and decided to study Rouse sarcoma virus in Renato Dobeco's laboratory. Dobeco was a guy who developed a plaque assay. Whenever something new came up, he embraced it. And when cell culture was first developed in the early 50s, immortal cells, he, he jumped on it and developed a plaque assay. And then he said to, to Temin, yeah, you can come in and study this virus. Now, the problem at this point is that the virus had only been shown to cause tumors in chickens. And Temin said, we can't figure out what's going on using chicken. We have to use cells and culture. So now cells and culture were just at the point where they could be used by a lot of people. So he tried to get the virus to, to infect chicken cells in a dish and cause tumors, essentially. But they weren't really tumors, of course, as you already know. He added the virus to a layer of normal cells. The infection incited them to grow uncontrollably, uh, forcing them to form tiny heaps containing hundreds of cells called foci. The foci tenement reason represented cancer distilled into its essential elemental form, cells growing uncontrollably. So you recognize this now as transformed cells. Here are some pictures of uh, transformed cells. Here is, they, they can have different morphologies. Uh, these are all avian cells transformed by Rouse sarcoma virus. You have these spindly looking cells here. And you can see that the transformed cells are, uh, are piling up and growing in foci uh, and not behaving well. So this is what Temin figured out, that you could take the virus, infect cells, and it would have a permanent effect on the cell. It would transform them permanently. All right? It's not cancer, as I've told you, but it's on the way to cancer. So he wanted to um, understand how that worked, and I'll tell you what happened in a moment. At the same time, about 10 years later, um, DNA viruses were shown 
to have transformative properties as well. Uh, in 1962, polyomavirus was shown to transform baby hamster kidney cells. In 1964, SV40 was shown to, to transform uh, a mouse cell line called 3T3. So Rouse's virus was an RNA virus. Now we have DNA viruses shown to transform cells in culture. In these cases, most of the cells die, but there were a few rare ones left with these DNA viruses, and they were transformed. So really, the first question I want to address is how can a virus infection transform a cell? We've been telling you a lot now that viruses kill cells, but a transformed cell lives forever, so how can that happen? Well, first of all, you have to modulate the cytopathic effects. You can't kill the cell, obviously. You have to reduce virus replication. And in fact, these transformed cells don't produce typically infected virus par infectious virus particles, and the cell has to keep dividing. It has to be immortal. These are the properties of transformed cells, so virus infections have to do this, and this should ring a bell. A, a transformed cell is a form of persistent infection, right? A persistently infected cell, the cell doesn't die, the lytic potential of the virus is modulated, and that's exactly what a transformed cell is. All right, the first question is, which of the following is not a property of transformed cells? One, increased requirements for growth factors. Two, immortality. Three, loss of anchorage dependence. Four, loss of contact inhibition. And five, colony formation in semi-solid media, which is not a property of transformed cells. Which of those? Sorry, screwed up. I totally screwed up, yep. I already have an activity in progress, damn. Mm, can I get to it? Okay, let's see, how'd we do? No, this is the wrong question. Where's, ah, here we go, thank you. How'd we do? All right, 81% uh, said increased requirements for growth fact. Where'd it go? You know, they just changed the interface, and it, I think every time someone answers, it goes, the graph goes away. This is really bright, guys. Good job. Anyway, 82% of you answered A, which is correct. Uh, increased requirements for growth factors is not right. Um, some of you answered loss of anchorage dependence. Um, the cell, transformed cells have lost anchorage dependence. They can grow in a semi-solid medium. Some of you have said colony formation. No, that's a, these are typical uh, properties of transformed cells. All right, so let's go through this story and, and see how Rouse sarcoma virus and those DNA viruses sorted out what's going on in transformation and oncogenesis. This was a, a long road, starting with Rouse's first observation in the 1900s. Um, so we have Rouse's story on the left here, which is his study with RSV, uh, and we're going to follow that to see how that was sorted out. On the right, we're going to talk later about uh, the studies with DNA tumor viruses and what they revealed. And in the 60s and 70s, people working on these two different kinds of viruses, their results came together to form a convergence and really uh, make this unified theory of growth control because that's what came out of this work. We finally understood what controls uh, the division of cells. So let's start with Rouse and his study uh, and his work with, the, with his Rouse sarcoma virus. How does it cause tumors in chicken? How does it cause transformation of cells in vitro? Let's get a little background on this virus first. Uh, Rouse is part of a family of viruses called avian leukosis retroviruses. 
leukosis, a different word for leukemia. These are in all chickens around the world, okay? It's a typical retrovirus with an envelope and uh, an RNA genome plus polarity. It has reverse transcriptase in it, so it can make a DNA copy and integrate this into the cell. But of course, Rouse didn't know any of this in 1909. In 1908, Ellerman and Bang actually discovered these avian leukosis viruses because they, they cause leukemia in chickens. They actually showed that these viruses cause leukemia in chicken, but people at the time didn't think leukemia was a cancer because it wasn't a solid tumor-forming cancer. So it was kind of ignored for a while. Most chickens are infected with avian leukosis viruses. A few months after they hatch, they get it from the other chickens in the hatchery. Leukemia develops in about 3% of these birds over 14 weeks uh, of age. Most birds have a transient viremia when they get infected. Uh, they become immune and they don't get leukemia. So a very few number of birds do get leukemia. And of course, they have to last longer than uh, 14 weeks. And in some situations, the bird, birds are slaughtered for food before that. As the birds get older, they develop other cancers as well. So first, 3% um, of the flock may develop leukemia. The remainder have nothing. But if you allow the flock to age, they will develop other cancers. And that was the bird brought to Rouse with his solid tumor. These birds develop various tissue tumors or sarcomas. And if you get virus from these tumors and you re-inject them into uh, new chickens, they cause sarcomas, not leukemia. All right, so if you wait and get solid tumors from these birds, not the leukemia, you get the virus from the solid tumor, it will cause a solid tumor, not a leukemia, in a fresh chicken. And Rouse isolated one of these viruses. That's what Rouse sarcoma virus is. Now, after Rouse did his initial experiment, he repeated it many more times, and other people came in and started doing the same thing, getting different chicken tumors from different flocks all over the world, isolating viruses, and they all got very different viruses as you will see, and most of them are defective. I'll explain that in a moment. So here we have a RNA tumor virus that is causing tumors in chickens. It's causing transformation of cells and culture, as you saw uh, Temin prove. It's a permanent change. So Temin got really interested in this, and he said, this, this virus must make a DNA intermediate and integrated into the cell for that cell to be permanently changed. And that's what made him go after the enzyme that would make that DNA from the viral RNA. And he discovered, along with David Baltimore, reverse transcriptase, and they received the Nobel Prize for that. We talked about that some time ago. So this is because Temin was reasoning this RNA virus, for it to permanently transform a cell, it has to make a DNA that goes into the cell. And that was the origin of reverse transcriptase. Now the question is, how does it cause solid tumors in chickens? And a key finding was that if you look at the viral genome from Rouse sarcoma virus and all the other viruses isolated from chickens that cause solid tumors, they were recombinants. It wasn't just the viral genome was present, but rather a piece of the viral genome was replaced with a segment of host DNA. We now call this DNA an oncogene because it has oncogenic potential. So the fact that Rouse sarcoma virus had within its genome a cell gene called an oncogene, which was essential for its ability to transform cells and culture, that was discovered by these two virologists, Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus, <clears throat> and they got the Nobel Prize uh, in 1989. So we have Rouse's Nobel, we have the Nobel Prize for reverse transcriptase, and now the, the Nobel Prize for discovering that these transforming retroviruses pick up an oncogene from the cell. Three, three Nobels for Rouse sarcoma virus. <coughs> so here's what's going on with these cellular genes. Remember, the birds as they age, uh, the birds that didn't get leukemia as they age, they develop solid tumors. These tumors have retroviruses in them and they're all derived from avian leukosis virus, that same virus that infects all the birds uh, within uh, shortly after birth. But they're all defective. They're defective viruses. With one exception, Rouse sarcoma virus, 
the virus that he first discovered turns out to be not defective at all. The oncogene that it has picked up from cells was added in addition to the viral genome. And all the other isolates of these viruses causing solid tumors in chickens were defective because they lost portions of viral DNA. And we'll, we'll look at this in a moment. All of these other viruses had different oncogenes in them. And Rouse had one oncogene, was isolated from a sarcoma. The oncogene was called SARC. But as other people isolated viruses from chickens that caused a variety of solid tumors, and then this moved into the mouse model, and people could isolate viruses from mice that caused tumors, they named the various oncogenes that were picked up uh, according to the type of tumor. And this is a gold mine for molecular oncology. They isolated so many different oncogenes by just looking at the ones that were picked up by these viruses. <clears throat> so here are the proviral DNA sequences of these uh, transforming viruses. So here at the top is avian leukosis virus. So that's the virus that infects all the chicken in the world shortly after birth. It can cause leukemia in about 3% of them. This is a typical retrovirus. It has a gag pollen omv gene, uh, and the proviral DNA integrated, is integrated into the host genome of the chicken. Rouse sarcoma virus picked up the SARC gene in red there from the host cell, and that allows this virus to transform cells uh, in culture. But you see, this Rouse sarcoma virus is not defective. It has gag, Paul, and envelope genes. And so this is a non-defective virus. All these other viruses, these below Rouse, these are all isolated from different bird tumors. Myeloblastomas, myelocytomas, another sarcoma, erythroblastosis, reticuloendotheliosis. These are all different sorts of tumors. And from them were isolated unique transforming retroviruses that picked up different cellular sequences. MIB, ETS, MIC, MIL, YES, ERB A, ERB B, and REL. These are cellular genes that allow these viruses to transform cells. So we call them oncogenes. All these viruses are, de are defective, you see, because they're missing essential sequences. Many of them are missing Paul. Uh, many of them are missing parts of envelope as well. On the right are uh, other mammalian transducing retroviruses from non-bird species. And here at the top is a murine leukemia virus, very much like avian leukosis virus, the progenitor of all of them. It's got an intact genome. You're probably wondering now why is this virus able to cause leukemia? We'll, we'll find out uh, in a moment. And from this virus infection of mice, you could derive a whole series of different um, transforming retroviruses, for example, Abelson murine leukemia virus, where the cellular oncogene Abel is replacing most of the viral sequences. There are also some retroviruses from cats you can see here, well, simian sarcoma virus, et cetera. And these all have the red sequences, which are oncogenes stolen from the host cell, which allow these viruses to transform. <clears throat> so uh, the defective viruses, which most of these are, require a helper to produce more virus. They're usually missing part of the envelope, the glycoprotein in the membrane of the virus, so they can't replicate without that. And for them to grow, they need to have in the same cell a virus that will provide the envelope. So that's why we call them defector. They need defective. They need a helper virus to grow. Rouse's virus was not defective. He, it grew on its own. So think about how lucky he was. Because if he had isolated a defective virus, he wouldn't have been able to grow it. And he might have given up at that point. But his virus wasn't missing any viral genes. It just had an oncogene stuck into it. And it grew, and all these observations then followed. So just to emphasize this idea about defectiveness, here's the parent avian leukosis virus from which all these others are derived. Here's Rouse sarcoma virus, just added the SARC gene, and here's an avian sarcoma virus that was isolated from someone else. You can see it's missing most of the viral genes, so it's defective. It requires, it has to be co-infected with an avian leukosis virus in order for this to replicate. So how do these viruses pick up cellular sequences? This is one model for that. We're not quite sure, because they're probably all different. 
But here we have uh, a proviral DNA. So it's a viral sequence, of, of course, from an RNA tumor virus integrated into the cellular genome. And you can see it's, it's got the two LTRs. And just downstream of the integration site is a cellular gene, which we've labeled onc for oncogene. So remember, the retroviral proviral DNAs integrate pretty much randomly all over the chromosome with certain sites in the chromatin that's preferred, but pretty randomly as far as chrom uh, chromosomes go. So eventually, it will sit down next to an oncogene. And you know, wild-type mRNA uh, can be made initiating at the left-hand LTR and terminating uh, at the right-hand LTR. Sometimes deletions occur uh, in the viral genome, which allow uh, the mRNA to proceed past the termination signal in the right-hand LTR. So now you get a longer mRNA, which now picks up some of these oncogene uh, sequences. Uh, this will get packaged into a virus particle, and we think it needs to be packaged along with a wild-type virus genome, so that reverse transcription uh, will generate uh, the two LTRs. All right, you're going to get non-homologous recombination during reverse transcription, so the reverse transcriptase will copy this LTR uh, and then jump over to the other genome and pick up the oncogene. This is a random event as well, so all of these are low-frequency events. Uh, and that gives you now a, a provirus, a, a new virus and a provirus with an oncogene in it. So we have GAG, Paul. In this case, we've lost some envelope sequence. Now, a lot of these oncogenes that have been picked up are different. They have various rearrangements or mutations that make them more potent. And you'll understand what this means in a moment. Uh, only a few of them are transforming simply because they're overproduced in a virus-infected cell. Many of them have undergone additional rearrangements and point mutations that make these cell proteins, these onco oncogenes, constitutively uh, active. So that's one way we think that, we, that a virus will pick up an oncogene, again, by transcribing through to the oncogene sequence. This is a very rare event because several low-frequency events are needed to produce it. Nevertheless, in the lifetime of a chicken with lots and lots of avian leukosis viruses produced, the probability is reasonable that this will happen. So, so far we've identified over 60 different oncogenes by these kinds of studies, by looking at retroviruses of various species of animals, not just birds, but mice and cats and so forth, that have been picked up by the retroviruses. We call these proto-oncogenes because when, when they're in the cell, they don't cause cancer, they don't transform cells. It's only when they're picked up in the virus uh, and perhaps changed do they become actual oncogenes. These over 60 genes are all involved uh, in growth control of the cell, in regulating the cell's growth control. As we said earlier, the ability of cells to divide in us is highly regulated. Most of our cells at any given time is not, are not dividing. And that pathway is controlled by these 60 different genes that encode different components of this regulatory pathway. The normal cellular genes are abbreviated C and some name, c -onks, such as C-SARC, so the precursor of rose sarcoma viruses, SARC is C-SARC, C-MIX, C-MOS, etc. Um, and when a retrovirus picks up these cellular sequences, when they're present in the viral genome, we put a V in front of it, like V-SARC, V-MIC, V-MOS. And as I said, most of these v onc genes are altered in some way to make them transforming. Only a few of them are transforming simply by virtue of their overproduction uh, in the virus. What do these proteins do? The, so this actually revealed the entire growth pathway that regulates mitosis in cells. The study of these viruses, these transforming viruses that picked up various oncogenes. So on this slide are the different classes uh, of functional classes into which these oncogenes fall. Again, all of these genes and the encoded proteins were discovered in viruses that transform cells, RNA tumor viruses. So for example, so this is the pathway by which cell division is regulated. If there are growth factors in the medium, they bind to a receptor. A signal is then transduced into the nucleus. 
and then transcription factors are made and they turn on genes that are required for cell division. All the components of this pathway were discovered as oncogenes in transforming viruses. For example, some transforming viruses have picked up a gene for growth factor. And by simply overproducing the growth factor, they transform the cells. It's like having a lot of serum in the medium. Many of the oncogenes are growth factor receptors. These are plasma membrane proteins that serve as receptors for the growth factors. So the oncogene is, is simply, nor, its normal function is to be a growth factor receptor. The virus picks up that gene, either overproduces it or it's altered in some way, so it's constitutively active. So the point is, every component in this pathway is going to be active, so the cells are always dividing. Some of these oncogenes are membrane brown protein kinases that are involved in transducing the signal from the growth factor. There's some G proteins like RAS in the cytoplasm, there's some cytoplasmic protein kinases, and then a whole bunch of uh, nuclear genes, which are transcriptional regulators, transcription factors, as well as cell cycle regulators. So in the normal untransformed cells, each of these proteins has a role to regulate cell division in a way that maintains the function of the organism. When they're picked up by a retrovirus, the, the regulation is gone, they're now overproduced or mutated, and now the cells divide uncontrollably once that these genes are, de are delivered by uh, a retrovirus. So to understand how they work, we have to look at the cell cycle, uh, which you know all cells undergo this cycle. Um, we have a phase of mitosis where the cells actually divide, and that's surrounded by uh, phases of DNA synthesis, the S phase, and a variety of gap phases. And a major control point for the cell cycle is right here, just before mitosis. There's a go signal that has to be uh, sent to the cell to make the cell divide. So DNA has already replicated in the S phase. Now the cell says, is everything right for dividing? That signal is provided by these proto-oncogenes, the pathway I just showed you. Growth are growth factors present in the medium? If so, we can go through this cycle. So all of these uh, control elements were discovered by these transforming retroviruses. We call these dominant oncogenes because you just need one copy in a cell in order to transform it. So you put these proto-oncogenes in a resting cell. They will stimulate mitosis uncontrollably without stopping. That's why they transform the cells. That's why they make them uh, immortal. Now, further study of retrovirus-mediated transformation revealed that there are three general classes of transforming retroviruses. We have ones that cause rapid tumor formation. That is, about two weeks after you infect the animal with a virus, you get a tumor, and that's Rouse sarcoma is one of those. And that's because these viruses carry a dominant oncogene like SARC. As soon as the virus infects, the protein is produced, it's overproduced, it's produced at the wrong time, the cells begin to divide, they're transformed, and eventually they go on to form a tumor, as long as they accumulate the right mutations. Then we have retroviruses that have intermediate kinetics of tumor uh, formation. An example is avian leukosis virus, the parent virus of Rouse sarcoma virus. It takes months for these viruses to cause leukemias. They do not carry oncogenes. Remember, when I showed you the picture of avian leukosis virus, I used it to illustrate a wild-type genome with all the right genes and no oncogene. It doesn't, these don't transform by picking up an oncogene. What they do is they transform by sitting into the genome next to an oncogene and turning on its transcription. Okay, and then we have, we call that cis-activation. Uh, and then finally we have uh, retroviruses like HTLV that are very slow at transforming cells and causing cancers. It takes years for tumors to develop. These viruses do not carry an oncogene. They do not sit down next to an oncogene as does ALV. Rather, they produce a regulatory protein, a transcriptional activator that turns on uh, other cellular genes and overproduces them and, and uh, makes the cell divide uncontrollably. So we call that transactivation. So here's an illustration of these three different types of transforming retroviruses. We have the rapidly transforming retroviruses characterized by SARC, Rouse sarcoma virus. 
these viruses have picked up a cellular oncogene, it's now a V oncogene, and the overproduction or the mutation of that gene leads to transformation. We have viruses with intermediate kinetics. Uh, these viruses do not pick up an oncogene, rather they integrate in the genome right next to an oncogene, and they turn it on uncontrollably. Remember, these are all regulated very tightly, and the virus infection is messing with that regulation. And then we have the slowly transforming viruses like HTLV, these have no, they don't pick up an oncogene, they do not insert next to an oncogene, but rather they pr produce uh, transactivating proteins that are needed to transcribe the viral genes, and these happen to also activate cellular genes, for example, like IL-2 and its receptor, and this causes the cells to divide uh, uncontrollably. Now, I said earlier that None of this is needed for the replication of most retroviruses. They don't need to transform cells. They don't have to pick up an oncogene or integrate next to one. They don't need to induce a cancer. But there may be one exception, uh, the virus that causes this tumor. This is the walleye dermal sarcoma retrovirus. That's a walleye. And this fish develops this tumor at a certain time of year. It's a retrovirus-induced tumor. And then, at some point in the fall, the tumor falls off, and that's how the virus spreads to other fish. And the fish is fine. This fish will go on living, never develop any more tumors. So this is one example where it might be that the tumor is actually necessary for transmission, not for replication of the virus, but for transmission. So there's a part in the virus reproductive cycle where tumor formation is needed. That's not the case for any of the other uh, tumor viruses that we know of. All right, the next question, which of the following allows Rouse sarcoma virus to transform cells? Presence of the envelope gene, presence of a Paul gene, presence of a SARC gene, presence of LTRs, or maybe uh, none of these. Most of you answered presence of a SARC gene. That's absolutely right. That's the cellular oncogene that this virus has picked up, which allows it to transform cells. The envelope, the LTRs, they're not essential because in many of these defective retroviruses, they're not present. So that is how studying RNA tumor viruses revealed the growth control pathway of the cell. But they didn't reveal all of it. The next half was revealed by the study of DNA tumor viruses. So let's take a look at that. This begins in 1933 when Richard Shope identified a DNA virus that caused papillomas, a papilloma is another name for a wart, in rabbits. And here are two rabbits with papillomas. Have any of you heard of the term jackalope? Yes. All right, so people, if you go online and search jackalope, you will see that people report this mythical animal, which seems to be a cross between a rabbit uh, and a, a jackrabbit and a antelope with, with uh, antlers. This is what they are. It's just rabbits with big papillomas. You can see they grow pretty big. These are harmless. They will fall off and the rabbits are fine, but they're caused by a DNA virus. I love this one. He looks really mad, doesn't he? If you saw him in the woods, you might get scared. So they don't hurt the rabbits. They just fall off. Uh, they're caused by a DNA uh, virus called the papilloma virus. Uh, later, Ludwig Gross uh, discovered similar viruses that cause tumors in mice. And these cause rare tumors um, in mice. The natural host of these viruses is the mouse. They're ubiquitous. They don't seem to cause any uh, role in mouse cancer. But uh, in baby uh, animals of different species, of not the normal species for this virus, hamsters, rats, or rabbits, these viruses will cause tumors of different sorts. And the fact that they cause many different kinds of tumors led to its name, polyoma, many tumors. So this is a mouse virus. In mice, it doesn't cause cancer, but in other animals, it does. Uh, later on, SV40 was discovered. This is a monkey DNA virus. It's a polyoma virus as well. It was discovered as a contaminant in the early batches of polio vaccine. Uh, these, vac these vaccines were grown in monkey kidneys 
and those monkeys that were used, they're captured monkeys and their kidneys were removed and put in culture, they had uh, SV40 in them. Uh, these viruses, so are natural viruses of monkeys, they don't cause tumors in monkeys, but they will cause tumors in hamsters. Parenthetically, many, many millions of Americans got uh, inoculated with infectious SV40 uh, as a consequence of getting poliovirus in the 50s. And there's a lot of controversy over whether this has caused any uh, tumors in people. I think the evidence indicates not, but uh, there is a box in the textbook that addresses that. So the natural host for this virus is in the monkey. It doesn't cause tumors, doesn't transform monkey cells in culture, but it makes it transforms cells of a different species. So this is a pattern now which you should recognize. These viruses are not transforming cells of their natural host. They're transforming cells of a different host. So this is a summary of this, the response of different cells to infection. Here are, uh, here's SV40, which is, in monkeys, is replication is permissive. The virus infects uh, and kills cells. Uh, mouse polyoma virus is not Per, monkey cells are not permissive for mouse polyomavirus, so nothing happens there. SV40 uh, is, mouse cells are not permissive for it. Um, mouse cells, uh, mouse polyomavirus, mouse cells are, per, are permissive for it. That's the natural source of that virus. Uh, and then SV40, again, being a monkey virus, but hamster cells are semi-permissive. Rat cells are semi-permissive. Uh, for mouse polyomavirus, again, hamster and rat cells are sem semi-permissive. And it is in hamsters and rats where you see tumors caused by injection with either SV40 or mouse polyomavirus. So note, not the permissive cells where the virus kills the cells, not the non-permissive cells where no uh, replication occurs, but in semi-permissive hosts. And this transformation of these wrong hosts, right, it's not the natural host of these viruses, is pretty rare. Uh, one transformed cell per 100,000 cells infected. Why? Why is this? So we're going to try and understand why, and this is going to make sense to you in terms of the mechanism of transformation. Now those were little DNA containing viruses, circular DNAs like SV40, which we talked about so much earlier in this course as models for transcription and DNA replication. So another family of DNA containing viruses that cause tumors in animals, those are the adenoviruses. There are many human adenovirus serotypes, none of them cause tumors in people. However, add 12 to 18, serotypes 12 through 18 cause tumors in hamsters, and 7 to 11 also, although not as well. Just like the transformation of cells by polyomaviruses and the papillomaviruses, transformation by adenovirus is a very rare event. And again, it happens in the wrong host. It doesn't happen in the natural host of these viruses. So what is in common to all these different viruses? Papilloma, polyoma, and adenoviruses. Well, they all make a T antigen-like protein in the infected cell. You may remember that SV40 encodes a protein that we call large T or T, and this protein binds the origin of replication. It's needed to unwind the origin and recruit the DNA synthesis machinery. Similar proteins are found in cells with polyomaviruses. In papillomaviruses, we give them a different name, we call them E5, E6, and E7 proteins, but they're the same idea. They're needed to initiate DNA synthesis. And even adenoviruses have T. Remember, the big T stands for tumor. That's how these were first discovered. These proteins were found in tumors of animals caused by these viruses and also in transformed cells in culture, cells transformed by these viruses. So one thing they all had in common was the presence of these proteins. They were called tumor antigens and the name uh, has stuck. So for adenoviruses, they're called E1A and E1B. These are essential viral genes. Remember, the SV40 T antigen is needed for DNA replication. If you take it away, the virus is dead in the water. They're needed for replication and transcription. They're needed for viral DNA synthesis. And these genes are the only ones left in common in tumor cells or transformed cells. So when you infect, you take a SV40 and you infect a hamster or a rat and you get a rare transformed cell, 
typically the only viral gene left is the gene encoding T antigen. Same for papilloma, the same for adenoviruses. And in fact, you can take the, T, the gene for T antigen from any of these viruses, SV40 or polyoma or adenovirus, just take that alone on a plasmid and put it into cells, and that will transform those cells in culture. It's a very easy way to make immortal cells. So if any of you ever want to take a cell, a primary cell made from a tissue, and make it immortal so it will grow forever and you can use it for your experiments, all you need to do is get SV40 T antigen on a plasmid and put it in those cells, and that's enough to transform the cells. Why, why, why this is so will become very obvious in a moment. Uh, T antigens are encoded by viral genes that are essential for replication, present in tumors and transformed cells, encoded by viral genes that have been incorporated into the cell genome, antagonists of cell cycle checkpoint proteins, all of the above. Good, so you picked all of the above, which is correct, 85%. Uh, these are encoded by viral genes that are essential. I, I told you that, so those who pick that, it's wrong. Present in tumors and transformed cells, that's absolutely true. Encoded by viral genes that have been incorporated into the genome. So I didn't actually tell you that these were incorporated in the genome. I said these are the only viral proteins, that, the only viral genes that are present in tumors and transformed cells. But the genes, the DNAs encoding them are integrated. And finally, Part D, we haven't talked about yet. That's coming up. They are antagonists of cell cycle checkpoint protein, because now we're going to talk about what these are doing. So, now, so far, we know that cells transformed by these different viruses have all T antigen in them. What else do we need to figure out this problem? So a number of different labs made the discoveries that these T antigen, these viral T antigens, are binding to different cell proteins. And that's how they're working. In particular, SV40 is binding a cell protein of 53,000 Daltons. Secondly, transcription of the adenovirus early genes, the E2 gene cluster, uh, requires a cellular transcription protein called E2F. There's now, it's now known that we have a family of such proteins. They're called the E2F protein. And finally, this protein, this family of transcription proteins, was found to be bound to a cellular protein called the retinoblastoma protein, RB. So three things, uh, interaction with P53, the requirement for E2F, and the fact that E2F is bound to a protein called RB. All three of these cellular proteins were subsequently found to be key regulators of the cell cycle. And their interaction with these viral T proteins, or T antigens, modulates that property. So let's go back to the cell cycle. And uh, here's at the bottom is the 24-hour cell cycle. During mitosis, of course, the cells divide. They've already accumulated DNA. They've replicated their DNA, so they're ready to go into the cell cycle. Uh, and there are various gap phases around mitosis uh, and the S phase. So cells replicate their DNA, they divide, and then they replicate their DNA, and, and so forth. And remember, there was a crucial go signal at the top before mitosis begins. There's also a restriction point in G1 before replication of DNA occurs. So whether or not the cell goes through this cycle is determined by these two checkpoints. The proto-oncogenes that we've talked about discovered in RNA tumor viruses uh, will sense whether growth factors are available and allow the cell to go through mitosis. Is the life outside in the outside world rich enough to replicate the cell? And all of the components of that signaling pathway were discovered uh, in retroviruses. There is, however, a second restriction point down here uh, in G1. So not only do the growth factors have to be present in order for the cell to go through mitosis, but other conditions have to be met as well and that is determined at this second restriction point. Because if conditions aren't right, there is no DNA synthesis uh, and no cell division. And this restriction point is regulated by the RB protein, which was found to interact with that E2F family of transcription proteins. Now RB, retinoblastoma protein, was discovered in young children who have retinal tumors. Uh, this, the gene encoding 
this protein in those kids is deleted. Both copies of the gene is gone, and they develop retinal tumors. And this protein was discovered in those tumors and called RB. But many years later, it was found to be a checkpoint regulator right here at this restriction point. Huge, huge finding, way beyond the implications for a retinal blastoma. So we call RB a recessive oncogene because both copies have to be deleted in order for the cells to divide uncontrollably. Remember, the dominant oncogenes, the ones picked up by the retroviruses, they're recessive. Only one copy is enough uh, to, um, sorry, they're dominant. Only one copy is enough to transform cells. RB, you have to delete both copies. It's recessive. So how does this work? Let's put all this information together. On the left, we have a cell uh, showing the pathway for control of the mitotic cycle. So if there are, say, um, growth factors present in the extracellular media, they will bind to a growth factor receptor, which will initiate a phosphorylation cascade that eventually results in progression through mitosis, the M phase of the cell cycle. And this signaling pathway, all the components are oncogenes identified in retroviruses. So if the world outside is rich, the cell will divide. A major regulator of whether DNA synthesis will occur after cell division uh, is the retinoblastoma protein, which is shown here in a phosphorylated form. And so this the state of this protein determines whether DNA synthesis will occur. And on the right, it shows you how retinoblastoma protein works. So retinoblastoma is the mustard-colored protein. In an unphosphorylated state, it is bound to this E2F family of transcription proteins. So E2Fs are needed for E2 early gene adenovirus transcription. They're also needed for transcription of the various cyclins that are needed for mitosis. So when uh, retinoblastoma is bound to E2F, the E2F can't turn on the synthesis of the mRNAs encoding all these genes that are needed for mitosis in cell division. It's only when retinoblastoma is phosphorylated can it be popped off of E2F. E2F now can stimulate the genes required for DNA synthesis and eventually mitosis occurs. So remember the growth factors plug in at the top of the cell cycle, they allow mitosis to occur, but you don't get the next round of DNA synthesis unless RB is phosphorylated, which will occur in response to signals integrated from earlier in, in the cell. All right, and this is why RB needs to be phosphorylated to pop it off of E2F, because E2F is essential for, it's a transcription protein, and it turns on genes that are needed for DNA synthesis in the cell. Now remember that DNA viruses do not like to replicate in resting cells because they require the DNA synthesis machinery. SV40 and adenovirus require various components of the cell. And most of our cells are resting, so these viruses need to kick them into mitosis. We talked about this weeks ago. The need to activate the DNA synthetic machinery by pushing the cells through the, the, the DNA cell cycle. So T antigens are the proteins that do that. The T antigens of SV40, papillomaviruses, and adenoviruses, these get made very early on, and they make the cell go through mitosis and eventually DNA synthesis. So, so normally in a lytic infection, the virus is doing this so that it can replicate its genome. How does this happen? Remember, retinoblastoma is normally bound up to E2F, that keeps the cells from going through DNA synthesis. These T antigens, E1A, large T, E7, they bind RB directly. Remember, this is one of the observations made after the T antigens were discovered. They interact with RB. They pull RB off of the E2F proteins without it being phosphorylated. E2F can then go on to turn on all the genes that are needed for DNA synthesis and eventually mitosis. So that's why T antigens uh, kick the cells into dividing, because they sequester RB. RB would not normally be phosphorylated. The cell is going to decide what to do that, but the virus is not waiting for the cell. The virus needs to get the cells dividing. 
So they make T antigen, which binds up RB and lets the cell go through the cell cycle. The entry is also under more control. We haven't brought in what P53 does. There is a, a there, if the cell senses that there is either DNA damage, double-stranded breaks in DNA, or unscheduled DNA synthesis, i.e. viral DNA synthesis, P53 can sense that. So here is P53. It can sense the presence of a DNA break, or it can sense DNA being replicated when it shouldn't be. It's a complicated story we don't have, to go, we don't have time to go into, but it knows when the DNA of the cell is being replicated under the normal conditions. When a viral genome gets in there and starts replicating, P53 can detect that. And when it does, it puts a halt to DNA synthesis. Uh, in the case of double-stranded DNA breaks, the idea is not to duplicate damaged DNA. So P53 says we're stopping DNA synthesis until we can make repairs. In the case of viral DNA synthesis, well, P53 is kind of an innate uh, immune response or even intrinsic. It's got to prevent viral DNA synthesis from occurring. And that's what, so here's what happens. P53 senses here double-stranded DNA damage and together with a number of other proteins, uh, it will bind to uh, promoters of genes that are needed for progression through the cell cycle, and it will induce apoptosis. So P53, when it senses unscheduled DNA or DNA damage, it will kick the cells, it will stop DNA replication, it will kick the cells into apoptosis, and that's why these DNA viruses need to counter P53. I told you this a long time ago, and I said, wait, you'll understand why viruses have to counter P53. This is why, because P53 is halting replication and pushing the cell into apoptosis. So these viruses all have antagonists of apoptosis to get around this. How do the viruses counter P53? They do it in all sorts of interesting ways, which are shown here. Uh, when viruses infect cells, uh, here is P53 getting ready to sense double-strand breaks or unscheduled DNA synthesis. Uh, and it is, it is net negated in a variety of ways by the different viral large T. So for example, SV40 large T sequesters P53. It binds it up in a multimeric complex so that it can't bind promoters, it can't induce apoptosis, it can't halt DNA synthesis. Uh, E1B also sequesters um, P53. The E6 proteins of the papillomaviruses and the E1B proteins of the adenoviruses cause ubiquitination of P53, which directs it to the proteasome and it gets degraded. Okay, so this is how the viral T antigens antagonize P53 so that the cell will continue to go through its replicative cycle, providing the virus with the DNA reagents that it needs for replication. All right, we're almost at the point of solving this mystery. First question, why are all the genes except the T antigen genes turned off? Those are the only ones that are left in transformed cells. And why is transformation so rare? So the reason it is is because uh, several low probability events are needed to suppress the lytic potential. You have to delete the lethal late genes of the virus. So when you infect permissive cells by adenovirus, the virus goes through the cycle and kills the cells. There's no chance of transformation occurring. But if you replicate in a semi-permissive host, uh, late gene expression is blocked, so the virus is not killing the cells. Uh, or in other cells, the deletion of the late gene may spontaneously occur. So you have to somehow modulate the production of late genes, which can happen either in a semi-permissive host or if it's the natural host, a deletion in the viral genome occurs so that the virus doesn't kill the cells. But this is very rare. And secondly, T antigen has to be on in every cell and transmitted to every daughter cell. Okay, so the DNA has to be integrated into the host DNA and T antigen has to be produced. So these are rare events. They don't happen in every cell. So remember, the transformation is going to end up with a transformed cell in which only the T antigen DNA is present. And for that to occur is very rare. So here's the story. In the end, the virus uses uh, antagonists of RB 
and p53 to kick the cell into the cell cycle to use it for DNA replication. If rare events occur to isolate the gene encoding those T antigen in the cell and keep it there permanently, the cell is going to become transformed. So these events, the transformation is not needed for the replication of the virus. The virus requires this to kick the cell into division. But remember, that cell eventually is going to die. But if, if some circumstances intervene where all the viral genes are gone except that encoding T antigen, that T antigen is going to keep that cell dividing forever. And that's why they transform cells. So these are really accidents of viral biology. They have nothing to do with uh, the normal viral life cycle. So DNA tumor viruses have to kickstart the DNA uh, synthesis cycle, and they use T antigens to do that. They inactivate both RB and P53. Uh, RB allows the cell to go through the checkpoint into DNA synthesis, and uh, P53 uh, antagonism prevents the shutdown of DNA synthesis and the induction of apoptosis. So this is how you get transformation. You block lytic events, you get rid of the late genes that would normally kill the cell, and what you're left with is a T antigen that's, that's transformed the cell. So it's a rare event. It's, it doesn't happen in a permissive cell very frequently and much, uh, perhaps slightly more frequently in a semi-permissive cell. So these cells are transformed. They're not yet tumorigenic. They have to replicate until they've accumulated these dozen or so mutations in various genes that I mentioned earlier, which will then make the cells able to cause a cancer. So all the virus has done is to leave behind a few genes which make the cells immortal. The cell itself really uh, becomes a cancer cell on its own because DNA replication is error prone. And if a cell multiplies uncontrollably, eventually you will have uh, all the mutations you need in order to be a cancer. All right, so this is the summary. You have two checkpoints uh, in the cell cycle. You have the, the go point. The proto-oncogenes identified in RNA tumor viruses ask whether there are sufficient nutrients in the medium to make the cell cycle go. And if so, the cell cycle proceeds. And the oncogenes picked up by retroviruses transform cells by pushing them uh, through this cycle. And the DNA tumor viruses antagonize this checkpoint down here. Uh, the tumor suppressor genes which regulate the passage through to the DNA synthesis phase, uh, the induction of apoptosis by P53, uh, those are targets of DNA tumor viruses. So this is how the cell cycle is controlled. And we understand it today at these two points entirely because of work done with RNA and DNA tumor viruses. It's a great example of how virology exposes uh, normal cell biology. And it all started with a tumor in a chicken. It just goes to show that you have to study weird things sometimes to make good discoveries. <laughs> <laughs>